Not all JDM cars are small, and not all JDM cars are weeaboo. Car here. Submit your car. Here. Right here. I get a Submit car. How do I know? I trust you enough to go commando in your presence. Some JDM cars, like the Toyota Century, are luxurious ships. And this Toyota Hiace is another example of that. It has electric curtains, dual air conditioners, swirling chairs, sound muffling carpet. It has an in-car intercom between the driver and the third row passengers. It has an air ionizer and parking sensors in 1994. It's so much fun to drive a car from another culture. USDM vans all followed Dodge Caravan's lead. They were stretched car platforms with a car engine and an interior optimized for ease of production and economy. We had luxury minivans in the 1990s, but all they were were up-trim versions of base models. If an American wanted more space, they would get an SUV or a conversion van, and if they wanted to camp, they would just go buy an RV. A Toyota Hiace, on the other hand, is a vehicle that spans all four classes together. Commuter vehicle, people hauler, cargo hauler, and camper. The seats do fold into a bed, but it's more of a pull-out couch than a bed. We'll be making out... If making out means holding hands while mutually masturbating and watching Donnie Phantom on an iPad taped to the headliner. Only now in the 2020s have Americans embraced vehicles that blur the line between car and RV, but we've done it in a strange way, through the lens of asphalt royalty called Overland Vehicles. And even I'm not immune. This high ace is a gas engine. Most high aces you find run diesels or turbo diesels, but not this one. Under the seats lies a variant of Toyota's 2.4 liter inline four petrol engine. The USA got a version of this in the base model Tacoma truck. The kickdown is enormous, and the, and the revs jump like 1,000 below redline when it does that. It reminds me of flooring Toyota Corollas in the 1990s when all seats are occupied and the trunk is full of brass instruments. I swear, flute and clarinet players have no right to complain about back pain. Now, if they help carry my timpani, fine. They're allowed one, oof, and that's it. You woodwind blowing, take your instrument on the bus with you, last to get back an opening set after a water break. Jesters. A high ace washes really easily if you're turning at a speed higher than 30 miles an hour, mostly due to its high ride height, high center of gravity, and short wheelbase. But I like that ground clearance, and it's good at dodging potholes because you just see everything. Backing up is easy too, but only if you stick your head out the window and look back along the side of the van. There's a lot of car behind you. Okay, the rear mirror. These things that are hanging off the back of these things. Delicas have them too. I still haven't gotten the hang of using them. You're supposed to keep your head forward, look in your own rear view mirror there in the front of the van, through the car, through the rear glass, into the rear mirror hanging off the back of the van, and down at the curb to see if you're about to back into something. It's an analog backup camera. I always thought these plastic wind deflectors were a cultural gimmick until I went at highway speeds in this high ace. One of the things that uh, Toyota and other manufacturers never solved was the aerodynamics of having the windows down while at speed. The wind just wants to whip right into the car and at you. That's what these deflectors do. They kick the wind out, but they only work okay. When I was driving, I stuck my head a little bit too close to the window, and I caught this blade of air that just came right in and perfectly found an opening between my eyeglasses and my cheek, and it went right in my eye. Ben, the owner, said he drove this van with the deflectors off for one day, and then, nope, he put them right back on again. No anti-lock brakes in this van. 
The wheels will lock up when you need to stop fast. And the wheels will spin if the van is unladen and if you torque load the gearbox. Maybe just on this high ace though, because this is only a two-wheel drive, rear-wheel drive model. Here I go, I go, go ding dong, here I go, oblong, here I go, uh-oh. I busted twice yesterday. People only look at you when they realize you're driving from the wrong side of the car. Because at a glance, a heist doesn't look like anything. It has a face more generic than a white run guard. I shave my balls for the elegant dinner. Okay, history time. Toyota Autobody, a subcontractor for the company, moved forward with the development of a small van in the late 1960s. The plan was to do their own version of a one-box European-style design. Yet, the High Ace didn't exactly stay that way. It went through more transformations than the rules to Calvin Ball. Minibus, crew van, Autobot, cab over pickup, time machine, panel van, frauding, an ambulance, a divorce and buggy, urethral sounding, a spacefaring ship in search of the lost 13th colony, and Cockvor. This is the fourth gen model, produced from 1989 to 2004. This comes with the 2.4 liter inline engine, which is designated the 2RZ-E. It makes 132 horsepower and 150 pound-feet of torque, and it has to move all this. And eight passengers. The van also has soft closed passenger doors just like a Lincoln Town Car's trunk. It has three sunroofs, a manual in the front, and automatic in the middle and rear, like having a mullet. The electric privacy power window curtains are there because this was the bang bus before the bang bus was the bang bus. Except it's too awkward and wholesome to be a bang bus. It's the bonk bus. This bus is so awkward, if it was trying to get to first base with you, it would touch your body and say, heh, lewd. Fuel economy comes in at just under 20 miles per gallon. And the fuel door is all the way on the back so you can fill it up while the passenger door is open. You also get front and rear independent climate zones. Toyota Hiace. Get in, loser. We're going to Delaware Water Gap. The Hiace is a vehicle of benign adventure. You'll never remember a specific outing, but the general feeling will linger. The memory of a time when everyone was in the same place and getting along. You want performance? Well, you're sending your briefs up the wrong flagpole. But it's different in the aesthetic department. With certain classic JDM vehicles, you have to sort of be in on it to understand the appeal. Otherwise, you're just looking at your ex's new boyfriend and his NPC face. You forget what he looks like the second he turns around, and lose track of him in any crowd, like a human game of three-card money. But then, BAM! The power curtains, serving up a big fat bowl of reverence, understanding, want, and need. You know your Maslow's hierarchy of needs? The system that details all things humans need to live a satisfying life, with the most essential components at the bottom? Let's talk about that. It starts with physiological needs, like food, water, and clothing. And then safety and security. Then love and belonging. Then self-esteem. And lastly, self-actualization. Because we need to feel like we have some kind of purpose or meaning. But you can only reach this pinnacle after all the needs of the previous four levels are met. So let's extrapolate this to the world of cars. What is the RCR hierarchy of automotive needs? At the bottom of the pyramid, does it run? We call this operational need. Does the car do the absolute bare minimum to satisfy my needs as a person who wants his car to go to a place? Yes? Okay, moving on. Does it pass inspection? Because we understand there's a difference between does it run and is it legal to drive. There's legal in Florida, and then there's legal everywhere else. And they're not the same. Let's call this level legal need. Third level, efficiency. Okay, so it runs and it passes inspection. 
Usually, that's all you get on Facebook Marketplace. But does it do the things I need it to do? Is it going to last? Or is this constantly going to be in and out of the shop? Because sometimes you have a Chevy Corsica that passes the first two levels, but it runs like garbage and the engine stumbles above 3,000 RPM, and it just it's just reminding you every step of the way that your life hasn't gone the way you want it. I know you deserve better. You know you deserve better. Even the car knows you deserve better. As it stutters, its flaccid apologies, exhaust popping like the music of hunting season in Adams County. The fourth level is validation. The, ooh, ooh, pick me stage. This is the witness me level. Do I feel cool and important? Do I feel valued and valuable? It's a very personal thing to consider whether or not your car actually compliments you. Does it flatter me? Do I feel fuckable and awesome? Am I attractive to the whole I want? Every car is an opportunity to get a thumbs up from a stranger or a why did you waste all our money on this from a loved one. It's a juggling act, like keeping your boss from finding out about your next job interview. And lastly, there's contentment. Do I enjoy driving this? Does this car fulfill me in a way that moves beyond other people? Will this fulfill me long term? Do I feel good about the choice I've made? Because there's one thing about driving a car to please other people, because driving a car that makes other people happy is very, very different from driving a car that makes you happy. Do I feel good about my choice? If it costs me a lot of money to keep this on the road, am I prepared to make that sacrifice? This is different from the previous stage because it speaks directly to your level of commitment. There are plenty of cars that satisfied me at stage four that I didn't keep because sometimes you're just not willing to go that extra mile. And maybe you get the car and you realize you're not the one best suited to owning it, even if it's something you've dreamed of owning forever. The fifth and final stage is about getting something that satisfies you so completely that you're willing to do whatever you need to do to keep it on the road. Now, Dave Ramsey would have some issues with this, but you're so happy with your choice, you stop looking for other opinions. You love driving it. You love the way it makes you feel, the way it makes you look, if appearances matter to you. Just having it makes you feel good. And even in the bad times, the positives outweigh the negatives. For Ben, this car fits all of those categories. Ben works in the railroad industry, and he drives this car every day, and he uses the company showers at the end of every day so his car stays clean. The cost of getting naked at work, carrying an extra change of clothes with you, and getting home a little bit later is completely worth to him. And after driving this, this airy tube of happiness, this airy tube of happiness, I completely understand. Hey guys, Roman here. I'm uh, stuck outside in some kind of parking lot. I don't even know where I am, but no song this week. Just a cheap plug to go to the second channel and check out our review of Pennsylvania. It's part of our new ongoing series where we review things that aren't cards, but in the RCR style. We'll answer such questions as like, I don't know, how great is Knobles? Also, what is Knobles? And that Sheets versus Wawa nonsense again. It's so good. Just go check it out. I don't know where I parked. Ugh. Happy birthday to me, right?